Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Bishy PE podcast. We're delighted today to be joined by Kimberly Lennox. Good morning, Kimberly. Good morning. Morning. And we're also again joined by uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. McHugh. Right, morning. <laughs> you stepped off. <laughs> so, thanks very much for joining us, Kimberly. Would you mind, uh, firstly, just introducing yourself and tell us a wee bit about yourself? Okay, so um, my name is Kimberly Rennix and I'm 32 years old. Um, I've My sport is judo, so I'm a professional athlete in judo. I'm kind of coming to near the, the end of my career. I've got a few years left, and then I've got to get into real-time work. Uh, yeah. I'm... Commonwealth champion in Glasgow 2014. I was one of the sisters that won the gold medal. Um, I'm number one in Britain. I'm number one in Scotland. And I, I basically, I travel the world doing my sport and fighting. Yeah. And do not be Nestle. <laughs> I'll be Coke Bridget. That helps it all out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the judo then. Uh, <laughs> Superb. So... How's, how's lockdown been for you um, and what have you been up to during, during this time? Um, it's, it's been hard not being able to train as much as what I want to. I'm used to six hours a day training yeah. and um, to try and do six hours of different circuits in the house is a wee bit or even just go out for runs. So yeah. um, my coaches from England and my coaches from Scotland have all been setting me different challenges each week. So each week we have a group chat and we get set different challenges, which is times or different circuits. And we've all got to send it in with video evidence, so none of us are cheating, yeah. um, to keep on top of it and distract us. And then I also do family challenges. So this month was to run my first ever 13 miles half marathon. Super. And I, I done that on last weekend. So I managed to do that in two hours and eight minutes, the first time I've ever ran it. So uh, good. Yeah. Any, uh, any 5K challenges? Uh, well, I do them for like wee warm ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I finish a long day at work. So um, I'm a support worker, and I was only going there for part time. But because of isolation, it's kind of became more of a full time job. So I'm yeah. out helping people that can't get out of their house or family members that can't get in to see them. So I'm yeah. trying to do as much as I can to help other people. Is that something that you've, you've sort of always done? Do you like, try to balance your training and your part-time job? Uh, it's, usually, it's usually coaching. I do as my part-time job. So it's usually uh, I coach kids or I go into schools and do chats right. and uh, try yeah. and get the next kind of athlete out there or just inspire the next generation of, of kids. Yeah. Uh, so this is a new kind of line of work, but because I like to help, I want to work with children, but um, adults seem to be the way I've went just now. And then hopefully in time it'll go to working with kids with behaviour or just kids that, that need that little bit extra help. Yeah. So if you can just kind of move on to your school career, um, how, how did you enjoy school and did you leave in fourth, fifth, sixth year? Um, so I don't know the way to sixth year. Um, yeah. Wish I'd left in fourth or fifth, but uh, yeah. I, needed, I needed the results for doing, like to go on to college and uni. So I kind of stuck in. And that's the way I wanted because I wanted to go on. But it was hard because I used to um, have to leave school early on a Friday, which doesn't sound hard to most kids. But that was because I had to travel all the way down to England for training over the weekends or I was going abroad to fight. So yeah. on a Friday, I used to have to um, uh, get extra homework from my teachers so I wouldn't miss out if I was going to be late on the Monday back. But yeah. I found school hard because I'm dyslexic. So I found it really hard when I was like doing all the writing side and the reading side but gave me craft and design P and I was hitting A's all yeah. the way through it and then I would come to the written part of it and I would almost be failing so yeah. I had to put extra work in but I did get scribes when it came to my exams which helped um, it just sort of uh, meant someone I had to sit in a separate class for everyone else mm -hmm. it kind of helped me become good at sport because I focused what I wasn't the best at and turned yeah. it into sports yeah, super. So you kind of touched on your a couple of subjects there, um, but what was your kind of favourite subjects at school? And was there any in particular at school that kind of role model for you? Uh, PE was obviously my best one because, like, uh, and that was my PE teacher, Miss Fairburn, at the time at Rose Hall, and yeah. uh, she was like that PE teacher that kind of could do everything, and she'd be able to play volleyball. We should have the longest nails ever. 
and still managed to like play volleyball and we'd be hitting it everywhere and she could control it. But she just in, like encouraged to do every sport and used to let me play football with the boys or go out and play the rugby with the boys. I kind of didn't like the netball sides. I liked all the more physical sides and craft and design because it was like hands-on. That was my other favourite subject to build stuff. Yeah. Superb. Um, was there any extracurricular activities at school that you were involved in? Um, and do you think that these kind of helped you to develop skills that were relevant for kind of developing into being an elite athlete? Um, I kind of tried to try everything that was going on after school or I just like to be more active. So it was, for me, it was any sport that was going. I would always try for six weeks. Because I always find when kids are, even when you're a bit older, you go along the first first or second week and you might not learn as fast as you want or you might be like oh I'm not learning much but it's just because everyone's at different levels so they have to yeah. like get everyone into the sport mm -hmm. and I always thought if you got to the six week mark and you still didn't like it then try something different but usually by the time I got to six weeks I liked it and I was trying to join the next club so each night I would be playing a different sport or doing something but then it, when I got to like 15 I had to then pick the one sport and sort of I go for it do you, think, do you think that helped you, like having that broad range of like, activities or sports that you were involved in? Did anything, could you transfer that over to your judo? Uh, I well, more of my judo transferred over into all of that. So for football, it helped me with speed. And because you're trying to control the ball with your feet, it helped my footwork in judo. Because yeah, I have yeah. to be able to move my feet one way, but my hands have to be doing something different. And then the same when I was doing rugby, the tackling and getting hit my judo kind of transferred into both of them because I could get up faster. I was used to my body taking the impact from judo. And then when I tried any other kind of sport, like any balls or hand stuff, like, so if I was trying netball, I was like, my hands were always fast because of I had to be fast to grab a judo suit. So I felt like my judo kind of helped me with all different sports, but it was like back at school that I tried to develop and got to try all these different sports where teachers would, well, when I when I was at school, teachers had to stay behind and take a class. Where now you can actually get coaches to come in and maybe be specific to that sport. Where it was like maybe the one teacher that tried to do all different sports with you. I think that's a really good message because I think a lot of people see the different sports that we do in PE and they see them as isolated and individual. But as like you said, there's so many transferable skills across across them all. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I think that's me then. So um, could you tell us a wee bit about your, your college um, studies then? So you you'd mentioned. So I went into sports coaching and development because I wanted to teach kids how to do sports, but I didn't just want to be a judo coach because I believe that if you learn how to catch like balls or do something like that, it helps you in life with all, all different things. But I think sport teaches you discipline and respect where you also learn that for school like in school you can't just shout out you've either got to stick your hand up or like when the teacher asks you something and that's what you've got to do in sport yeah. so I decided to go into coaching because I wanted to like teach the next kids how to do different sports or even just be like you get a bad behavior kid well people say that they're bad behavior but sometimes they just need a focus and that focus could be a sport to get that energy up or or just get them like just get them distracted for a few hours and they just get to release like in my sport we can't kick and we can't punch but you get to pick people up and you get to throw them about but you learn how to control your anger you yeah. learn how to control your strength so yeah. you have to throw someone but you don't want to hurt them because you want them to come back and train with you mm -hmm. so you learn all of that just within sport but then listening to the coach is where you learn at school because you have to listen to a teacher so they kind of all, I feel like they always join together and that's what I try and believe in life and that will go into my working life. Like I have to listen to my boss, but I also have to be independent to be able to speak up for myself. Yeah, 100%. And do you think that was something really important? I think, again, you touched on it that you, you wanted to make sure that you had something outside of judo. Obviously, you, when you were at school, you were already at a very high level, but you said you wanted to have something to maybe fall back on. I always wanted, because I never knew if I was going to make it to the next level. So I was British champion, I was Scottish champion through school, but I never knew if I could make it to Olympics. I never knew if I could make Commonwealth or Worlds. So I always had to have education in case I get injured because you could walk out and fall over a kid and that could ruin your ankle for doing a sport. 
So it's not that the sport's going to damage it, it's just anything could. So mm. I think education is really good. But if you're good at a sport, like go for it, commit to it, but always just have that something that you know you've got the grades that you can go in and, and do something to help. And could you tell us a wee bit about how you get into judo then? So maybe um, My dad just was a sporty man and at four years old, I was put on the mat. So, and I just seemed to, to love it. But I think it's because I got to wrestle boys and beat them up without getting into trouble. So it kind of... It kind of just went on for there and I just kept doing sports and I kind of never fell away from it. I've been injured a few times and wanted to maybe give up, but it's kind of then once I get over my injury and sort of I get back to training and start achieving again, then it kind of makes it all worthwhile having the highs and the lows mm -hmm. in your sport. Do you feel getting into judo at a young age, you and your sister are quite close in age, aren't you? Do you think that There's helps? six years between us. All oh, right, right, six years. But everyone thinks we're either a little closer or we're twins. Right. So I always see that as a compliment to her because she looks young or an insult to me that I look old. So I never know what way to take it. <laughs> but um, there's six years between us, but we are, we ended up becoming closer when I turned 16. Because yeah. when I was younger, it was just like I was that annoying little sister that followed the big sister about and her friends. Yeah. Um, but when I turned 16 and we started actually going to the same competitions together and then we used to fight the same weight so we had to fight each other so it was kind of like once we stepped on that mat like she wasn't my sister anymore she was just another person on the mat and yeah. then the minute we stepped off it was like you had your wee moment right she's beat me I'll have my wee moment in the corner then next minute we're back and we're talking and we're fighting away with each other again so we just became really close and I think that sport done that to us because we travelled together and but once we outside our sport we've got separate friends people think we spend a lot of time together but we actually go and do our own things except from both his love rugby and we go and play rugby together as well on our weekends off I, I read something that um, your dad Thomas was, was a big influence in your, in your judo career um, he was my coach I was both of your coaches um, until we got yeah. to like a certain level that he just found that he couldn't take us any further so yeah. he passed us on to the national coaches which I believe that's what you've got to do as a coach I think some coaches want to be the best and want to get their athletes to the best but sometimes you've got to pass them on to someone yeah. that knows a little bit more about you or a little bit more knowledge and my dad was more he's brilliant with kids and he's brilliant until you're up to the age of about 14. And then after that, it's better than going up to the next level. So usually now my dad passes them on to me and my sister. And we take them to the next level when we're coaching. Do you think you and your sister kind of fed off each other? I always think professional athletes, when they've got a, a brother or a sister, it's almost like having a training partner all the time. Uh, well, we, were, we were training partners, so yep. we knew when each other were tired. Yeah to give each other a break but we also knew when each other were trying to be lazy right. like we just were like oh I'm really tired but you weren't so we knew how to push each other and we knew when right you know what we've pushed each other to the limit this needs to be an easier session or this has to be a harder session but a lot of our siblings in judo cannot train together like they used to fight like cat and dog and they ju you just had to keep them separated where we and my sister actually performed better together yeah. so we shared rooms together when we went away and when we trained and Every time my sister would do well, I would want to do better. I would want to yeah. try and lift as heavy as her or try and do as good in the gym. And then when she was injured or I was injured, we kind of helped each other get through that. Yeah. So it didn't matter who won the medal because both of us knew, do you know what, I helped you get that medal. Okay, I didn't do as good this day. I might feel bad. But then seeing my sister go up and get a medal kind of made my day better because I was like, do you know what, someone done well, one of us done well, and we, we helped each other both achieve what we've done. Excellent. Um, just kind of moving on to your professional career, uh, what would you say is the best part about being involved with judo? For me, it's it's the discipline and respect that you learn in judo and the fact that it's a worldwide like sport. You have to go around the world to kind of fight it. Once you get to a certain level, you have to travel to do the competition. So the people that I've met doing that and then from judo, we get all the science behind us. So we get like the nutrition behind us. We've got a weights coach. We've got all the different coaches for different like things, like techniques and that as well. And then we also like, and have, if we get injured, we've got the physios there to 
to help us once you get to a certain level and you make it like you've got all of that as an athlete so the athlete doesn't do it on their own you've got to be talented enough to push yourself but it's a team behind you that make you who you are and obviously what would you say your career journey has been like then oh it's been up and down so as a kid it was pretty good i was always winning medals quite every weekend and it was that was good coming back and getting your wee article in the paper and you were always smiling younger and then the higher level you got up i was doing well and then they were like have a few injuries and try to come back and then changing weight categories so i went from being the bigger weight to the lower weight and then i started winning quite a lot and and then like getting to the Commonwealth, um, Commonwealth Games, but the two years before it, I qualified for the Olympics. But in my sport, only one person gets to go each weight. So it came down to a vote, and the picked three coaches voted for another girl, and one coach, two coaches voted for me. So it was three against two, and um, it kind of was like heartbreaking because that was my dream, and it had literally been taken away from me in a vote, even though I was higher ranked in the world. I was doing better in competitions, but it came down to that vote and I, I didn't get to go and I just wanted to give up. But then the Commonwealth was in two years' time and I thought, you know what? She's going to fight for England. I'm going to fight for Scotland. I'm going to prove them wrong. They should have picked me and I'm, I'm going to beat this girl. So I trained really hard for the next two years, put everything into it, and then she moved up the weight category and got my sister in the final. So my sister beat it for me. Good. But I wanted that. I wanted that to prove a point. And then I was on a really big high after the Commonwealth Games. What was that experience like? What was, um, what was Commonwealth Games like? Uh, it was an excellent... It was just... I fought the first day, so... I was overweight in the first day, and my sport was finished after three days. So I had the next seven days to watch every other sport and just see what Glasgow was like through this and it was like Glasgow was the best it was ever going to be like the people were just so nice we happened to have good weather with the sun for the eight, 10 days yeah and it just all the athletes being in the one the one village because you go and watch other sports but you don't get to live with everyone it's usually all the individual sports themselves so everyone was just so nice and just like I was lucky like I got a medal some people didn't get medals but winning that medal and like seeing your face in all the papers and then everyone going, oh, I remember you at school. And it was a nice thing to see because my sport in Britain, a lot of people don't know what it is. Yep. So the Commonwealth and the Olympics is the only time people really get to see it mm -hmm. unless like you go to a class. So it was nice to let people see it on TV, like friends that actually had never seen me fight before had all managed to get tickets for that day and saw me fight. So it was just like half the crowd was like family and friends. So it made it even more special and then 45 minutes later your sister taking the gold you couldn't yeah. ask for a better day yeah would you say would you say that's probably your highlight then of your career it's definitely the only way i'm going to top that is by going to the olympics and getting a medal yeah or going to the next commonwealth and my sister being the coach in the seat and coaching me to get the next medal yep right, okay, right. but Stephen, you're talking there um, just about the, the Olympics, is, is that a funding reason that you can't go to the Olympics or is it purely numbers? Or It's it... purely just you've got to be in the top 22 in the world and they only take one for each country because they want to make it as much countries into it. Yeah. So sometimes Japan have like four people, like right now Japan have four people in the top 20 and they can yeah. only take one. Yeah. So the other three, even though they have qualified outright, will not go to the Olympics. Well, yeah. And that's just the way the sport is. So it's not like athletics where as long as you're fast enough, they can yeah. take like five people from Britain. They can only take one. And if your country doesn't qualify, then you don't get to go. That's just it. So right now, 48 is the only kind of girl's weight that's not qualified, and that's my weight. And it's just because I've kind of came back for a few injuries and not done the best that I wanted to do. And then the coronavirus came and kind of put a stop to all of that for me. Mm -hmm. Also, obviously, you mentioned there one of the highlights was um, the Commonwealth Games and getting gold and, and your sister following that up an hour later. I read uh, an article, um, I can't remember what, what paper it was in, but in relation to sort of setbacks that you've had. Now, I've got it here, obviously, the first, you, you spoke about the first one at London, it was, you lost out in a boat, you then missed real with a shoulder injury, and then, obviously, just recently, the, the coronavirus. Can you tell us, like, 
about those setbacks and, and how you felt and, and come back from it? Um, each one's kind of been, the, the hardest one has probably got to be the 2012 one of Hope because I was actually, like Britain qualified everything, so we knew that we had a team going to the Olympics and we signed like a contract kind of thing if you were in the top 100 because you don't want to just send a player in that's not ranked and not doing anything. You do want to have them on the tour. Um, that was probably the hardest because like it was a vote and I knew that I had done better and I had and it was just that was completely politics and I can't do anything about that. And then the next one was an injury. Um that happens in your career, but it was a bad enough one it put me out for a full year. So it was a, a full year I was out and then but I know I've given it everything and if I if I don't make it to the next Olympics then at least I can like finish my career knowing do you know what? I gave it everything. I didn't give up just because I got one setback. I didn't give up. I kept going. If I gave up after 212, I wouldn't have been Commonwealth champion. Yeah. If I gave up after 216, then I wouldn't have been able to like be the next time British champion again. And I've been on the British team since I was 12 and never not made it. So I don't want to then finish it with not doing so well. So you're going to get the injuries, but I've got a really good family. And I've got a really good support of friends that kind of used to pick me up and help me get back from all the injuries. So, like, when I'm down on my own, I'm like, oh, I don't think I want to go back. And they'd be like, well, look what you've achieved. Why don't you just try and go back for fun? Mm -hmm. And then I would train again for a bit of fun. And then the next minute, the love of the sport would come back to me. And I would be like, right, I'm ready to go again. Like, no, I want to compete. I can't just do this for fun. I need to, I need to do the competitions. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it might just be... Do you know what? I'm going to retire and this is just going to be a fun thing to keep myself fit. Mm -hmm. It's like when footballers retire, sometimes it's just five a side, but they'll meet up with their friends and do it. Yeah. Still mm -hmm. staying involved, but you still, you're still you always going to have that competitive side to you as an athlete. That's mm -hmm. never going to go away. I mean, I'm already challenging a five-year-old, which is my niece, to a handstand challenge, and I was like, oh, I can hold it longer. And she's five years old, but then she decided to go and do the splits, and I can't do that anymore, so she won the challenge. <laughs> But I'm 32 and I'm challenging a five-year-old, like, well, I held it longer than you. So I'm so competitive. Ah, and I'm the same with my brother and sister. Like, we're always challenging each other to try and to try and be better than each other, but it's all in fun. That sounds a bit like us. We're always challenging each other. That's the next one, by the way. The splits challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. I, I, I'd fancy my chances with that, with you. Ah, that's about the only one you'd win me, man. <laughs> Right. We we uh, we speak to our, our kids, particularly in higher, uh, advanced higher, about different types of training. So, what's your training regime like? Uh, obviously, with the, the coronavirus, um, how often do you get to train? So, normally my training regime is I train every morning from nine o'clock to like about one o'clock, and then I would get to schools and do talks, and then I'm back training at night from seven to like half nine. Right. So it's like six hours a day we yeah. train and if I've got competitions coming up and I need to get weight or anything like that, then I do a bit more extra running and that. During this quarantine, it's just kind of been whenever I get a break for work, yeah. go out a run and try and fit in. So I'm trying to fit at least, if I can do an hour a day or an hour and a half training a day, even if it's like 30 minutes in the morning, 30 later on and then 30 at night, like I just need to do, it doesn't need to, you don't need to go to the gym and do loads of hours of training to get in shape you just need to do different types so we do hit sessions where it's short and sharp and we're just like 20 seconds on 10 seconds off but it'll be 10 reps three minutes rest and you might do that four times so it's like a 40 minute workout and then we'll be in the gym and we do olympic lifting and that's making us strong and getting us ready for you've got to pick people up and throw them about and then you've got all your different kind of judo so your techniques is when we're working on our skills and then at night time that's our fighting so that's putting all of that that we've done our fitness our strength and our techniques all in together to make us even fitter and we do that for like two hours and you'll fight boys and you'll fight girls in training to make you faster and stronger different weights different sizes so that's kind of like the training monday to friday i train like that and then my weekends is competitions and as i said i like to play rugby so if i get a weekend off then a sunday is my rugby day Brilliant. i'm on I just like to be active. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got to be 
question, just a, a kind of personal interest of mine. Have you ever thought about getting into MMA? The reason I, I say that is just I want to do boxing. I've right. done a wee bit of boxing training and I've been told I've got a decent puncher in me. Right. But I don't know if I would like my face actually getting hit. So I, I, I see MMA and I go, do you know what? You could get yourself fit enough, go into that, and it's really good money because I'm an athlete that doesn't make money doing my sport. Yeah, so you yeah. see that money and you think, oh, I could do that. But then at the same time, I'm like, I kind of like my face the way it is. So <laughs> I, I kind of do don't want to make it older and looking more battered than what it already is for judo. So um, I think I'll just stick to maybe doing boxing for fun. Just because the reason I said that, uh, Ronda Rousey, who was... She was like the yeah. pioneer of women's MMA, I think. She was a, a an Olympic medalist. She was the first ever American Olympian. Her yeah. mum was the first world medalist. And then she was the first ever USA lady for judo to get to Olympics and medal. And then now after her, Kayla Harris, who's yeah. now transferred over in MMA. Yeah. And she's double time Olympic champion. And now she's transferred over and she's doing really well at it. So it is something. I think the judo background helps you because we've got that wrestling style. Yeah. The only thing is we need to then learn how to punch and properly kick because we don't punch and kick. Yeah. So we're good at getting close and getting the strangles and the arm locks, but getting that reaction to someone just punching you, yeah. you've maybe got to have a, a certain attitude for that. But if you coat bridge, probably do have that attitude in there. So <laughs> I think I was born to do it, but it's a bit late in my career to change over. <laughs> you, me you mentioned there, Kimberly, about um, judo, you don't get paid. Is that right? Nah, we don't, so... How, how does that work then in terms of your day-to-day -day life? Like, is that a bit of a challenge for you? So you've always got to have like, a part-time job or you've got to have really good parents that won't take rent off you when you're young. So when you get to... Unless you've moved out your house, where because I travelled so much and then I lived down in England for the last three years, my parents have always kept a room in the house for me. But it's like just having part-time jobs to make money and then your money goes back into your judo. So your sport will send you to so many competitions so you might be doing 15 events out of the year mm -hmm. great britain might send you to five funded scotland might send you to two so then you've got to find the funding for the other like six or seven like just that way and that's what it would be so you do fundraisers you try and get sponsorship but it's a sport that not everyone gets to see so try to get sponsorships mm -hmm. a bit harder because people see it as your individual but there's a football team, so I'm going to get 11 people or 12, do you know what I mean, like advertising for me. You can get a football team, might have 20 players. That's 20 people tweeting. That's 20 people. So the company's more likely to go for a football team, a rugby team, or a, like a sport like that, where judo's individual. So you've got to have a person that's yeah. going to be confident to advertise and go to all these events. And it's a sport where I sometimes can be away three times in the one month. So I'm not guaranteed I'm going to be home for events. So... But I had family members that always done fundraisers for me and if they're doing it for someone else, they would always put aside a bit to fundraise for me and that sort of helped me throughout my career. I've yeah. always had to have a part-time job of coaching or in doing like, some school work or even just like working in like, part-time at McDonald's, which was the worst when you're trying to eat healthy and all yeah. you smell is McDonald's when you come home. Yeah. And it was a way that I had to, you had to do it and then you do get some funding where you can do it, but it's not enough to live off of. Oh. Yeah. Enough to cover your bills, but actually to have like a life outside it, it's not. So that's where you, it's good to have something outside your sport to yeah. help you. Yeah. Scott, is it me or you? Um, I'll be the last one. So have you just got any advice for any young aspiring judo players or judo fighters? Um, just to be like, it's never going to come just easy. Sometimes you're going to get throws or moves that you think, oh, I learned that easy. And then when you go to competition, it doesn't pull off the same. Yeah. But sometimes actually losing makes you a better player because yeah. it makes you then work harder and makes you become, and that's what makes you a good person as well. Like being able to adapt to if you do get an injury or if you do, but it's just about putting everything in. So if you're committed to the sport and you want to train hard, I believe like you've got to have a bit of fun You've got to enjoy the sport because that's what makes you good at a sport. Yeah. I think if you don't enjoy it, then you're in the wrong sport. You have to enjoy it because it makes it everything better. It's like work. If you enjoy work, it's so much easier. And if you enjoy doing sport, it makes all that work better. So when you get the highs, that's the best. But I believe just like putting the hard work in, 
Like it's not going to be all wins all the time. It's like a roller coaster. You're up, you're down, you're doing somersaults when you're injured and you're like, but it's just about, you know what, take a step back and then just refocus and be like, right, what's my next goal? Okay, I want to make Olympics, but that's a four-year goal. What's my next goal for the next month? I want to learn this. I want to learn this. I want to go to the gym and lift this little bit of weight. Just set little targets and then the big targets become so yeah, much yeah. easier to hit. What's this sort of mindset like, like before, before getting into a, a judo match? Like, are, are you trying to stay focused, stay concentrated? Or are you trying to build up that anger to get that aggression? What's, what's your sort of mindset? I think everyone's different, but my mindset is I try and not focus too much on it because if I do that, then I focus too much on what my player's going to do. So I, I watch a video of what my player does and I'll have in my head, right, they're left-handed, they're right-handed, their favourite throws this. But it doesn't matter what they're going to do because I need to throw them. So I need to focus on what I'm going to do, what am I best at. So if they're left-handed, what do I do against a left-hander? I have to focus on what I do best. So... I usually try and distract myself by talking away to someone just so I'm not too thinking too much. Other people stick their music on and they just get into a zone and they walk out in a zone and then once you step on that mat, so I see it as when I'm off the mat thinking, I just kind of go on a wee chatty zone, but when I step on that mat, it's all about fighting. It's just about I want to win and then get off and then I can relax. <laughs> right. um, I, I've got a couple of other kind of questions that I'm just from more into. So, is there a particular country that are, are, are so good at judo? Um, the, the best, the best is the Japanese. Like they are number five. Well, actually, they're probably they're number ten in the world. Is probably better sometimes than some of the number ones in other countries. Okay. Because they've just it's a big sport over there. But like the French and the Russians and all that are all are all really good. So if you actually watch the Olympics now, it used to just be Japan, Japan, Japan. But actually now, a lot of the other countries in judo now are just getting so much better. We're the same in France. In France, you become world champion and you get that much money, you can get yourself a house and a car. It's like their third biggest sport. So they're like professional footballers. Like their faces are on buses and all of that. And the same way, like certain countries like Russia and Georgia, see if you become an Olympic medalist, they get so much money put into them because they've done their country proud. Um, so there is countries now really going for it. It's just Britain's good at it. We're just not advertised as much. And that's what we're trying to, we're trying to advertise it a lot more. It's in schools now a lot more. It's like out there a bit more. We just need to win a few more Olympic medals so kids kind of focus towards it. Like we got to the last one. And uh, so we're still sort of a... Each year now we've kind of got a medal at the Olympics where we went a wee while where we weren't doing that great. But we're starting to now get the world champions. We're now starting to get the Olympic medalists. So hopefully like we start getting added bigger events and we start getting more events in Britain instead of going away so much to fight that the bigger events, all the countries will come to us. Yeah. That's the that's the aim, I'm hoping. <laughs> Is that profile a wee bit more into it? So yeah. Right. Um, Can I just come in with a quick question just now? Um, just with regards, how, how uh, like in advance do you find out if they're going to be going to, say for example, a Commonwealth or an Olympic? Like how, how far in advance do you find out? And uh, see, on top of that, is, is there a particular pressure on you to maintain that weight, obviously, in the run up to that? Um, I, so we can't, we can't even weigh like I can't weigh forty eight point one on our scales or I feel that's right. it, no second chance. Like you get test ways, but the minute you step on that scale, if you're over it, that's it. No competition. So you could have trained for three years and step on a scale, and that's you. No, no Olympics. No, if you yeah. qualify. But the Olympic Games, you'll sort of a you can see on like a leaderboard. So you'll go into like the website, and it'll tell you like the world ranking, and it'll show you where you are. So you can kind of see if you're in qualifier or if you're just outside it. But like for this Olympics, the last competition was going to be at the end of May would have been the European Championships and that would have been the last event to get points and then the Olympic teams would have been announced by each country Yeah. and then you would have fought in, like, I think it was June or July but it was going to be the, the Olympics it was going to be an earlier summer and then for the Commonwealth Games it's up to your country what their criteria is so for 2014 we found out two months before if we made the team or not but I was quite lucky because I'd done really well at the start of the qualifiers so in the first three events I went to, I picked up three gold medals in three different countries. 
So my ranking points were at the top of the leaderboard. So I had no worries, but the rest of the girls, it was right down to the wire. Two of the girls had the same amount of points and they could only pick seven girls to go. And they were, start off, there were nine years competing, but then two kind of dropped off. So there was only like eight of us and only seven could go. And it, two girls had the exact same points and it came down to a vote and they were different weights. So it came down to a vote who went. So, but for me, I qualified a bit early. So I kind of had that stage where I could relax and just focus on training. Where a few of the other girls were all the way up until literally two months before. And then we got a letter out saying that you're going. And this is going to be the next two months training <laughs> leading in. You were saying there about um, the weight. How, so how does that work in terms of the process? Do you need to weigh in a certain day before the fight? Or? So I weigh in the morning. No, sorry, then. We used to weigh in the morning, the morning off, but now we weigh in the night before. So we weigh in at like 7 o'clock at night. Right. And then we get to go for dinner, eat for dinners, and then the competition could start at 9 o'clock in the morning or 10, depending on what country you're in. So it's usually a 9 o'clock start, so you're up at half 7 for breakfast. You head down for 8, you start warming up. And then you could be the first fight on or you could be fight number 20 on. So you've got to kind of keep yourself warm and active and get ready to go when they call your, your name and your weight. But it's all about exercising and a healthy diet. Like, I do have McDonald's. I do have little takeaways. Um, I have not been waiting five hours at McDonald's the last two days. Oh, no. No, I've not been... I'm kind, of, I'm kind of off with them now because I've kind of been eating a bit too much bad food, so I'm kind of back on my health kick. Right. Um, but it's just, I treat myself, I'm a love iron brew, so that's like that's the only downfall I've got. I love to drink that, but I like treat myself and then I'll just do an extra wee run yeah. to, to burn off the calories. But as long as I keep eating healthy, mm -hmm. I train enough to keep myself in good condition. So, But if I get too heavy, then I move up the weight category. But it's just hard to do when you're halfway through like a, a cycle. So you have to commit kind of thing. Unless you know, right, I'm not going to make that Olympic, so I'm going to change weight and focus for the next the next four years. Yeah. But it's kind of like once you commit to a weight, you can't then decide a year before, well, I'm just going to jump up a weight category because you'll never qualify for like Olympics or anything like that. But you'll still qualify for world championships if you fight good enough. You still get Europeans. Yeah. It's just certain ones you have to maintain that for that competition. Would you say it's a wee bit different to the, the likes of like wrestling then? Because I know wrestling, they're really bad for cutting huge amounts of weight, like water weight a lot of the time. Up. Yeah. Just limits. Is it no, you, you, do, uh, you do get people that do it bad. I've done some times where I've not really been paying attention and I've, I've went a bit heavier than I ever wanted to. And I've got to do that. I've got to stick on the three jumpers and go for a run. I've got to jump in the sauna for two hours. It's part of a sport. It's something you don't see. It's not something you advertise that you're going to do. But it's something if you maintain a good healthy diet, you don't have to do. So you're going to kind of stick to the healthy diet and maybe let yourself go off once or twice and do that hard one. But it's like MMA, they like they do extreme stuff to make weight. And you see them on the scales, they look tiny, and then the next day, they're massive. But we've got a 5%. So if I weigh in the day before, the, the night before at 48, and then I randomly get picked at 9 in the morning to go and get weighed, if I weigh any more than 50 kilos, I fail. Right. I don't well, get to fight. I shouldn't really put on two kilos overnight, yeah, but yeah. some people do. Yeah. But yeah. And then the heavier, the bigger the gap is. But for my weight... I'm allowed a two, two kilos out. So if I drink a two litre bottle of water, that's two kilos. Yeah. So I've got to hope that then I get that all out of my system <laughs> before the yeah. next day. Yeah. Interesting. See, in terms, of, in terms of moving forward, how do we get you to Tokyo next year? How do we get you to Birmingham in 2022? How do we get you there? Do we um, get you to the Tokyo one, that I think that's, we're just going to have to wait till. Um, the, this all takes off to see what we're going back to training because I think judo is going to be one of the ones that takes longer to come back mm -hmm. because we are physically contact. We have to be wrestling each other. We have to be on a mat. So you can't exactly what move to one side of the mat and someone's going to run behind you wiping up. So I think mass sport might be one of the last ones to kind of to come back, but we'll still be able to do all our conditioning and all of that. But for Birmingham, um, we're waiting on the criteria coming out. So once Scotland gives me that criteria, then I'll know what to do. But 
I think it'll be similar to the one for the 214 is the top seven in each pick, people will go. So you'll have seven girls and seven boys that can go. You can either take two in a weight or you can take one in every weight. So you could take seven girls and have one in each weight. Right. Same with the boys. Or you could take two heavyweights, two middleweights, two lightweights, and then just pick a random weight. It depends like what weight categories I've got people fighting in. So depends if I want to go for 48s and try a double at 48s or do I want to take over my sister's weight and take her title off her because she retired. So unless she pops out of retirement in the next year and a half, then um, I could maybe take her title off her and be like, oh, well, I'm actually the Renix that holds both titles. <laughs> but I would, do you, th- like, see, in, in terms of that, do you think, um, what's I, got? I forgot what I was going to say there. I was going to ask. I was going to ask. I was going to ask. Will that? Right, so that's going to. Will that be an easy transition for you then? Say, for instance, you you better go from the forty-eight to the fifty-two. Well, I tried it as a tester in um, January, uh, January and February. I was trying a few events at fifty-twos because I was kind of getting right. I'm a wee bit older and. I kind of, I find it harder to stay at seven stone seven. It's not a natural weight. Yeah, I'm yeah. only five foot two, so that's still tiny as it is, but eight stone four is more natural. Um, and I got, I got two silver medals and, and I went to the Scottish and one, I got a silver at Scottish. So I beat all the Scottish girls and it was an English girl that beat me, but now I know how she fights. Then I'll be able to give her a better fight the next time. So I tried it out. But it just depends internationally how strong the girls are. Because I used to fight 52s internationally. Right. It was leading into 2012 Olympics. I decided the four years before to come down to 48s because me and my sister were both trying to go to Olympics and only one of us could go if we stayed the same weight. So I was a chunky sister. So I, I decided to come down. And that was all through nutrition and speaking to a dietitian. So I got all my body fat done and... They told me that, okay, you're a full-time athlete, but your body's sitting at 20%. You could drop down to 18%. You'll still have plenty of, of like, I'll still be healthy. And I could, I could drop lower if I wanted, but it means I could make 48 without doing any damage to myself and it'd be healthy. So I decided to take that step and decided, okay, I'm not allowed as much sweeties anymore. Yeah. Or McDonald's <laughs> or Chinese. <laughs> See that difference in so 48 to 52 now, that, to me that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but did you not, do you notice a massive difference in terms of size of a pony? Uh, muscles, aye, because uh, my sister's not much bigger than me. I'm 5'2", she's 5'4", right. but when we get into a gym, I deadlift 100 for one from my max, and she reps out like 130 for like reps of five. Right. So it's kind of like, that's only four kilos heavier. But then you can sit two kilos heavier than that and then diet down. So then you could be, that's six kilos that I would need to then put on. But I would need to do it not in fat. I'd need to do it in muscle. So, but the girls are, when I fight them, they're strong. But my 48 speed kind of helps me a little bit. So I try and catch them early or I try and tire them out. So then their strength isn't as strong. But by then, hopefully I'd have built myself up and I'll be more at their level in strength. But it's not much of a difference, but actually when you're fighting, sometimes it can be. So, Commonwealth, a double Commonwealth gold champion could be on the cards then, is that what we're saying? That's what I'm aiming for, because we've we've got a double medal in Scotland and it was um, a silver and a gold. So the first one, they got silver in Manchester, then 12 years later, Sarah Clark got gold in Glasgow. So she definitely, she retired, so she won't be coming back. And the only other time is, I think, a good few years ago, it was like a double bronze. And it's because someone fought their weight category and then they fought the Open. So they got a medal on the same one. So I'm hoping to be the first one to get the double gold because a lot of the girls have retired that were on the team. Yeah. And I'm the only one, there's three years that are still kind of about that could do it, but they didn't get gold. So... I'm hoping that I can be the one that um, gets Scotland's first double gold. That's the aim. That's what we're aiming for, Groy. Yeah. Um, just before, I've got, I've got to finish a question, but I was reading that you've, you've set up your own sort of judo club as well. I, I'm not going to embarrass myself and try and pronounce it. Um, it's called Kano Kwai. 
you know, quite so. How have you how have you found that? In terms, I take it obviously you you and your sister and your dad are, are doing a lot of coaching through that. Aye, so it's always been a family club. That was my first ever club that I started it. Right. And it was like a pound to go, and we used to do it in Kitchell's Primary School. Now we do it just next to the town Kitchell, and we still we only charge two pound, and you only have to pay if you come. So it's not like a monthly payment that parents have to pay. It's not that. It's, it's two pound. You come along. We've just managed to fundraise and get loads of brand new mats so we've got and now we've got three different classes we've got under eights over eights and then we've got a senior class so it's a 45 minute one for the younger ones and then an hour an hour we do it on a monday and we're trying to do after school ones so we've done one we've done a full month it was free and we ended up getting 30 to 40 kids coming along and then they started coming to our, our club and it was good and then the virus kicked off so we're doing online Zoom classes and we send it out and we do judo and they've got to beat up the pillows because uh, some of the parents have want to get thrown about. So we've had to give them teddies or pillows they've got to chuck about there now. But we're hoping if we try and keep as much kids like into it on that, then when we finally get back and we'll open up. But it's good because we love to see even just a kid that doesn't want to fight. They might not want to do competitions, but they want to just come along because they want to learn the sport. Yeah. we're not there to try and make everyone do some people get too nervous and they can't do competitions So, but you can still go up to a black belt you can still get yourself up to a black belt and do that way or you can go to the competitions so we've got different kids, different ages, different levels so we're trying to build that up but it's, um, it's a charity club that we're doing it but it's under his Kano Choir and then we've got the Golden Sisters where we go into schools and we do a bit more that's more a business side yeah. but I mean See when, uh, sorry, see when you go into schools, do you teach pupils and teachers, do you do any kind of hands-on demos? Cause I'd um, I, so we, we usually will come, we'll come in and do a demo and just, just say it was a high school. So you yeah. might say, right, we want you to do our like third and fourth years. So what we might do is we might get like a wee 20 minute or half an hour with each kind of class uh -huh. and we would come in and each class would like come on as a small group and we would maybe put so many on the mat at the time. We would teach them a pin. We teach them how to get out of it. They get to do a mini wee fight. We'll then do all the standing stuff. We'll throw each other about so they see the bigger throws. And then we say to the school after it, would you like to try a six-week block? And we can come in and we'll do six weeks. And then the, the school make a, a costly walk what it would be charged. Depends like, if we have to hire the hall or if the school are like, right, you can use a hall, but the kids only pay like two, three pounds and it'll be like an hour session. But you do six weeks. And then if you want another year then to try it, and then we'll advertise whatever the local club is. So it's not all about just coming to Air Club. When we get into schools, Air Club might be too far away from you, but there might be a club round the corner. So what we'll do is we'll get you six weeks into it, and then we'll say, this is where the nearest club is to your school. And then the kids go to it. But if they want to come to Air Club, then that's their choice. Uh -huh. Sounds really good. Yeah, you're just asking that. You just you're asking that question. Can you think you've got a chance against me? Have you? I, I just want to get my hands. Remember, just just you remember, you're a bishop, bring you to your bishop, bring boy, right? Like, I'm an East End boy. <laughs> you remember that? Well, we can always after quarantine, we can come in and have a a, a coaching session for you, and we'll see who's the best. I mean, look at me squeaking now. Get my work on. Wow, here we go. <laughs> Right, generally finisher. Um, we've all seen the, the karaoke carpool. You had four guests or four passengers. Who would who would you want in your in your uh, your karaoke carpool? It oh, could be so got... stars, pers any personalities, any favourite people, or some, maybe some some personal people. Right, so I would I would probably like Jessie J for singing because I actually quite like her and I've got a tattoo. Jessie J. Jessie J. Oh. Wait. Can you can you get that tune? <laughs> no, can't sing. Nah. <laughs> I'll stick to my sports. <laughs> I'll give it a sign. I'll embarrass myself on, on publicly. <laughs> um, I would like someone funny in it, so know how the Mrs. Brown's boys, the guy right. there, ah, he yeah. would be great entertainment, so he would keep it light and funny. Yeah. Right, if, I could, if I had to have a footballer in there, I'm a, sorry, I'm a Celtic fan, Henrik Larson. Oh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Who this is a Rangers fan, so it's a, it's a good um, battle when, we're, when it comes to Celtic Rangers in the house. Who was um, the Celtic player, sorry? Henry Larson. Oh, all right, okay, yeah, of course. Of course. Can't, can't, that's, that's why I supported Celtic. I'm all the way. Um, <laughs> oh my God, look, could be my fourth one. But I think what singers are actually I'm into right now, what ones I'm listening to. We've got a singer, we've got a, a sports person, we've got a comedian. I know. 
So if I had to have an actor, then it would have to be um, Jessica Alba, because I wanted to be her when I was a kid. <laughs> I watched a programme where she was fighting in it, and I was like, that's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Mr Alvin? Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you very much, Kimberly, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, we look forward to seeing your progress hopefully over the next few years. And uh, for anybody that is joining us today and watching us, make sure you get across to at Bishop PE and follow us on our Twitter page. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. See you later. See you later.